Um, in the last few events that uh, Library for Perceptual and Cognitive Systems organizes, we collaborate with uh, the software company Accenture. And uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, symposia and conferences, we always have uh, some slots for uh, uh, Accenture Med Science talks, which are usually intended for a wider audience without any uh, background in the area. And today we have uh, two uh, Med Science talks, and um, um, I'm, I'm um, um, pleased to welcome Professor Michael Glansberg from um, Northwestern University and a couple of words about Michael. Uh, Michael is a prominent uh, theorist of language, logic, and cognition. And um, after graduating uh, from Harvard, he was a professor at uh, the MIT, at the University of Toronto, uh, then uh, probably the uh, uh, most extended stay was uh, the University of California, Davis. And uh, currently, he is a professor uh, at the uh, Northwestern University Philosophy Department, uh, but also affiliated with the Linguistics Department and Cognitive Science Program. And he's also the Director of Undergraduate Studies for Cognitive Science at Northwestern University. Uh, Mike Landsberg has made a substantial contributions on the overlappings between logic and language, linguistic relativism, psychological roots of language, uh, processing, the interaction between meaning and use and syntax, application of mathematical methods to the study of language. And uh, he's a co-author of uh, two recent wonderful books, Formal Theories of Truth and Oxford Handbook of, uh, of Truth, both are uh, by Oxford University Press. And he's also authored nu numerous prominent papers with a uh, high impact on the development of uh, research areas such as language, cognition, logic. And uh, I'm, finally, I would like to emphasize that uh, Professor Mike Lansberg is a wonderful friend and also um, he's um, the chair of our lab's uh, international consulting board. And uh, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, our lab, we are especially proud and, and glad to welcome Mike Lansberg to, to the talk on truth and models and science. I now have to live up to. This is getting more and more difficult. Um, so let me say a little bit about this talk. I think this is something of an interlude for the symposium because for this talk I'm not putting my hat on of thinking about language and cognition. The other area of work I've done is theories of truth. Um, theories of truth are things that philosophers have been thinking about for a long time and logicians have tied themselves into a great many knots about, far more than maybe we ever should have, but we did. And so what I thought I would do for this talk was talk a little bit about truth and its relation to <coughs> science, and in particular sort of try and talk a little bit about truth and models. So I want to start with what the issue is, the big issue. Here are, let's see, I think this is the laser, right? Yeah. Here, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can see them because the, the text got a little too small. Here are some great long dead or not so long dead figures talking about science and truth. Science is but an image of the truth, said Francis Bacon a long time ago. And here's Linus Pauling, a not so long dead Nobel Prize winner, telling us that science is what many people describe it as, the search for truth. Um, now philosophers come in. If you're not used to philosophy talks, here's the general thing that we do. We take a good idea and we mess it up. <laughs> That's what we do all the time. This is a really good idea. And I do hope that it's not an idea that we lose by the end of the talk today, but I'm going to try and tell you that things are not quite so simple. I hope that's not too depressing, because this is a great idea. So, today's topic is philosophy of science. As I said, we're not, I'm not right now doing anything about cognition or language. And none of my examples turned out to be from cognition. Probably I should have changed them, but. Um, we want to think a lot about 
where truth fits into science, obviously, because that's where we started, and also things about evidence and theory, and how they all combine. That's what I want to spend the time on today. It should be warned if you're used to science talks where people actually present facts and data and results. This is going to run at somewhat more abstract level. I'm going to ask about the nature of various things. Philosophers of science love to ask about the nature of things that we otherwise think we understand. And as I was saying, make it all confusing. So everybody think, you know, everybody who actually works on real facts about what causes what doesn't get confused about what the nature of causation is, but philosophers can. And for now, we get confused about the relation of truth and evidence to theory. So back to those classic quotes. They suggest a kind of set of platitudes about the nature of science. And as I said a second ago, we're going to do this quite in the abstract, but we'll get to a few examples in a few minutes. Science provides us with knowledge, right? That's its job, about whatever you like, the natural world, the social world, any part of the world. And so it's true would seem to be the way things are supposed to work. And how does it do it? Well, you collect evidence, you build theories, you test them further, and eventually you hit upon the truth. And you are done. Uh, sometimes maybe that's right. Maybe. But very often it's not. And so what I'll do for the rest of the day is to illustrate a little bit about how that can go wrong, and then talk about what we're supposed to do next, because there certainly is a temptation out there if you encounter these problems that we'll talk about to think that somehow truth doesn't fit into the matter at all. But that is rather far more pessimistic than I want to be. We want to be responsible to data. And what I'll be doing is highlighting things we do other than simply Particularly, I'll highlight the way that we work with models and what we do with them. So that's our goals. Quick review of some things that I take it everybody who works in these fields knows. But it's not a bad thing just to absorb them again. What do we do in science? Well, one thing we do is just Observe and directly gather data. Um, I'm blaming poor plant biologists here who actually have to go out into the field, wear boots, and you know, collect samples. Sometimes that's the end in itself. Right? You know, if you discover an interesting plant or animal that nobody knew about, you have a result. Um, one thing that's worth reminding ourselves, even though it's not absolutely central to where we go next, this idea of simply collecting observations and calling it results is not specific just to the poor people who are out there wearing boots and collecting animals and plants. The same thing goes on quite a bit in the biomedical fields. Now, it's true that you know, they get to wear lab coats and gloves and eye protectors and hopefully don't get themselves infected with things. But occasionally, a straightforward observation of the existence of some cell in some particular place in your body is the result. So sometimes these things are straightforward collecting of data. That's probably not what we want in the long run, though sometimes it's incredibly useful. So the first topic we want to talk a little bit about is what's left out if we just think about collecting data. And I think, again, this is something that people who work in these fields know, though, again, I think it's worth kind of reviewing once more, laws and explanations are left out. We very much want those. Simply collecting data, simply finding an animal or finding a cell in some particular place doesn't all by itself do what we want because we'd like to be able to explain things. And we'd like to be able to generalize. And thanks to the history of science, we know a little bit about what we think laws and generalizations should look like. 
Best example that we all love to talk about is one that if you took an elementary physics class, as probably most people in the room did, you had drummed into your head and had to work many problems about, simply Newton's laws. But the thing about these is that <coughs> they are laws. So these are not simply reports of data. These are strong generalizations. And we all know them. Um, if the net force on an object is zero, then the velocity of the object is constant. Force is mass times acceleration, things that you learn. If you survived your first physics class, you learn to repeat over and over and over again. But these are really striking. Actually, as we go forward, we'll see that they're extremely striking. We don't know that many examples of things that are this good. These laws come from observations, of course. They don't come from nowhere. Everybody knows this story. I actually can't remember what the actual story is. So Galileo is supposed to have climbed up on the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropped a large cannonball. And I'm never quite sure what the other thing he dropped was. I think it was a small cannonball. Are there small cannonballs? <laughs> or, or maybe it was a feather in some stories. But anyway, he dropped two things that you might have thought would fall at different rates. And of course, they did not. And we learned a lot about um, laws of motion that way. And historically, of course, there's some story. I don't actually understand the story. Newton was supposed to have an apple hit his head and the theory of gravitation just somehow appeared. But nonetheless, right, what happened was there was lots of observation. Some of it fairly intentional, like climbing up on a tower and dropping various cannonballs. Who carried the cannonballs up the tower? Was that Galileo? I'm not really sure. Um, but the thing about laws is that they're not just reports of observation. They're really strong generalizations. The nice thing about Newton's laws is up to a point, which we'll talk about in a minute, they just simply hold. They hold of everything, sort of, almost. They hold all the time, everywhere, sort of, almost. And the goal of these things is that when we really have something that's a law, it is supposed to hold all the time, everywhere, of everything. Because that allows us to make predictions. It allows us to say something will obey the laws, and therefore it will wind up in some location at some time if the forces on it were a certain way. And allow us to explain things. Why did that fictional bridge that Paul was just talking about collapse? Because of the forces on it. <laughs> well, maybe it'd be better with a real but we can explain lots of events, we can predict lots of events, precisely because laws are very strong generalizations. We like our laws to be confirmed, so we don't just sort of look around, come up with a law, and then walk away. We do lots to continue confirming it. Actually, in the case of Newton's laws, I'm not sure how much extra we had to do, but we certainly keep track. Confirmation. Confirmation is a very complicated topic, which I'm not going to get into very deeply. For the moment, practically anything can count as a confirmation. You can get direct observations. Sometimes in many sciences, confirmation is a statistically very complicated endeavor. It can involve instruments if you want. I believe that's supposed to be a bit of Fermilab. Um, you can use very complicated instruments. Galileo didn't need complicated instruments, except, I guess, the tower. Um, but you can use them or not. And so the picture we get is that we build theories. So we started with data. And what we do with our data, according to this lovely picture, is we build up theories. And theories give us laws. And laws are very strong generalizations as strong as can be. And from those generalizations, we're able to make predictions and make explanations. This is a lovely picture of how science works, one that I think is fairly familiar and great. Really is a good endeavor, right? Data, theories, predictions, explanations, all the things that we actually want. Where does truth fit in? Well, it's supposed to be front and center here. 
When we get a well-supported theory, which is finally confirmed by a massive amount of data, it's true. And so truth is front and center in the whole endeavor. Back to this idea that science is the search for truth. Here's how you do it. Collect some data, make some generalizations, find the laws, identify them, fully confirm them, and you're done. You have truth. Lots of it. Um, useful ones, because they tell you what's happening in the world, and they allow you to predict what's happening in the world. So you have not just trivial, boring truths, you have lots of really striking, important, interesting, valuable ones. That's a great thing. There's a catch here. Oh, I really just ran through that, actually. All these parts of observation, experimentation, laws, theories, confirmation, they all figure into this idea of building up these wonderful, important truths. Is my catch here? Yeah. There's a catch here. That picture is usually just wrong. It's kind of a big catch. It's rather frustrating. It's rather frustrating because that picture I was just describing to you is one that we really would like. And it would be great. And maybe we have it from time to time. But by and large, that is not quite right. And there are two different things that can go wrong, at least. Probably there are several. Oh, things that can go wrong, right? There are lots. But there are two I want to focus on. Here's one observation, which again I think won't, dis won't totally surprise people that are working in these fields. Extremely well confirmed theories can be false. And so remember the picture was we gather our data, we formulate our generalizations, we get lots of confirmation, and then we've got things that are true. Well, not always. Here's one of my favorite examples, because it involves stress. Um, not the phonological concept of stress, the psychological one. Um, for a long time, your doctor would tell you that ulcers were basically caused by stress. It had something to do with acid in your stomach, but the cause was stress. And by the way, this was not an accidental haphazard claim. This was actually an extremely well-confirmed claim. There were lots of studies, there were lots of medications produced on the basis of this. People were prescribed them, they were tracked longitudinally over God knows how many years. So this was actually really well confirmed. And it's false. A few years ago, somebody discovered that ulcers are caused by a bacteria that nobody had noticed before. So the first observation is just that extremely well confirmed theories can this was a pretty good case. I don't think if this was the total of the problem, we'd really be that shocked. We'd just kind of get used to it and go on. Sure, we're highly fallible creatures. Especially, uh, the example I gave you is a biomedical one. Human bodies are massively complicated. And the kinds of data gathering techniques we have are relatively limited because we're supposed be nice to the humans. Um, and so, yeah, not a huge surprise that sometimes this can all be misleading. We're fallible, these phenomena are complicated, our data is limited. We thought we saw confirmation. Well, I guess it wasn't. We pick up and go on. We study the bacteria. Um, so it was a mistake. That's a huge philosophical worry. I mean, there are deep worries here about what counts as confirmation. Okay, we thought of the theory was extremely well confirmed, and it turned out not to be. But that's, when it comes to issues about truth and falsehood, that doesn't really give us great pause. Oh, I thought it was true, it turned out to be false. I shall move on. Well, it depends. If you were making those ulcer drugs, you probably are not going to just move on, but the rest of us will. But the history of science shows us, and this is a case that's so well known that I don't think it becomes any surprise, this is not the only way things go, on, go wrong. 
And so the famous case, extremely well known, but again, I think worth reviewing, <laughs> is just the fate of classical Newtonian mechanics, which again is, in a certain way, extremely well confirmed, extremely useful. Anybody who's studying engineering spends all of, I mean, if you're a mechanical engineer, you use classical mechanics day in and day out. If you want to know why the bridge fell, that's what you do. But as everybody who gets through their first physics class knows, it's not actually true. It's false. And this is the one that's actually deeply frustrating. It's false, and you know, to review a little bit of the physics here, I'm not a physicist, so if there are physicists in the room, they can probably fill in this in much more detail, but false at very high speeds, and it's false at very small sizes. And I guess in a certain way, it's also false at very large sizes. Now the thing is, this, unlike the case of our bacterium for ulcers, isn't just a breakdown of confirmation. Because the, the confirming data keeps, I mean, to the extent that we even need it anymore, it keeps pouring in every second. This is a problem that's not just that we made a mistake. This is a more sort of thoroughgoing kind of problem. I mean, it's true that, you know, the speeds and sizes that we needed to falsify this theory are rather hard to find. It turns out, actually, my friends in engineering tell me that we do now use it much more robustly than we used to. So apparently the fine-tuning of the GPS system where things work at very high speeds and over modest but significant distances requires taking into account time dilation and length contraction, uh, which I didn't know. But apparently, this is how, they, how detailed they have to get into work. So it's not like you never encounter this. But certainly back in, you know, when was that working? Hundreds of years ago, it was not imagined. So what we have here is a different kind of failing. And this is the one that I think is more serious for thinking about truth. Because this theory is not in any simple way just wrong. There wasn't any straightforward mistake that was made. So if a mechanical engineer who's trying to figure out whether the bridge collapsed is appealing back to good old Newton's laws, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing incorrect about it. If your doctor tells you that your ulcer was caused by stress, there actually is something wrong with it straightforwardly a mistake. So there's something still good about this theory. Now in this particular case, the set case is actually a little easier than some of the really, really hard ones, we can say a little bit about what's good about this theory. There's a certain sense in which it's approximately true. The nice thing about this example is I can actually tell you a little bit about what approximate means, because as the sizes get closer to the middle and the speeds get closer to the middle, or actually get, too, get slow enough, it begins to approach truth. So in this case, I can actually tell you a bit about what it is to be approximately true. Theory gets better and better and more and more accurate as you get to the right sizes. But here, actually, I want to sound a note of caution. Is it right to say the theory is kind of true, approximately true, something like that? Well, yeah, in this case, I think we can get away with it. Precisely because the theory tells us a lot about what the conditions under which it goes wrong are. Sometimes it's described as we have boundary conditions that we can state for the theory, right? They works in certain domains and not others. And it's very much the physics that tells us how that so in this case, I think we can get away with it. But I really think that we can't go too far. So there are two observations that sort of mil militate against going too far with this. One is just that it's not really clear that truth is an approximate notion. Kind of true isn't true. Um, it just isn't. If somebody, if somebody comes and says something that's false, and they say, well, it's kind of true, that means it's false, and they thought they could get away with it. <laughs> kind of true is an extremely elusive notion. For many years, people tried to work on formalizing notions of approximate truth, or truth-likeness was the way this was labeled in the literature. 
didn't go so well. We really never did quite come up with this idea of kind of truth. So this is a problem. I think that there's a really fundamental sense in which even though the physics helps us to know what kind of means in this case, kind of true is an elusive notion. And the other thing is, remember this idea of generalizations? Laws are supposed to be incredibly strong generalizations. Well, we've hereby taken that back. They're no longer full generalizations. They're only generalizations that hold in some domain or another. And even though in this case we know what the domain is, this is disappointing. You have to check what's going on before you make predictions and make explanations. So this really weakens what we were up to. So what do I think we want to do with this? Well, there's two things that we need to do. One is, you do have to learn to live with fallibility. Uh, I think anybody who's reached past the age of about 10 understands that we have to learn to live with fallibility. But this idea that we really get it right if we just collected enough data and just have fine enough machines, well, that's never quite right. We have to learn to live with this. But in these cases where things are really deeply resistant to being true, I think we need to have to think again about what this picture of science of building theories which, when well confirmed, should be true, really turned out to be. So that's what I want to think of next. Right. Um, right, so that's just reminding me where you're going next, which is what I already said. We want to try and refine this picture. I gave you a very, very old-fashioned view of what science is like. Probably, actually, for this particular audience, where almost everybody is a cognitive scientist, nobody probably believed that model. <laughs> um, we want to start talking about models. And the reason is because models' relation to truth is rather different from the way theories relate to truth. So a huge amount of science Outside, I mean, it's really hard to decide where that picture I just gave you actually occurs. Fundamental physics seems to be a place where it at least sometimes happens. Uh, maybe evolutionary biology, but I'm not sure. And I'm not sure what else. So probably everybody who works in a lab here doesn't use that approach. Um, what we usually think about are models. And their role is somewhat different, but actually helps us a little bit to think through these puzzles about truth. So I want to talk about models. What are models? Well, actually, this is something that a lot of work in the last few years has shed some light on. There are a lot of things that are models. Thinking about what the variety of things that can count as models are is a sort of fun game all by itself. I'll do a little bit of it, just to get the ball rolling, ooh, bad pun for the frictionless plane example that's up there, but uh, just to get things started, I won't finish the task. Sometimes models are what we describe as idealized models. And again, there's a physics example. Um, if you took your physics class, you probably had lots of things explained to you through talking about what happens on frictionless planes. Very useful. They help to clean up the equations. They help to figure out what things should look like. They're great. Uh, they don't actually exist. You can't buy them. But what's useful about these is that they do represent limits of things that you can buy. You can buy a sheet of Teflon, which is pretty low friction. They used to use these air tables. I actually don't know what they use now. Um, but people build things that have less and less and less friction, and you can make observations on them if you need to. At this point, we don't because we can just run the calculations. But if we needed to, they existed. What we have here is a kind of limiting case of something which is real. So one way we build a model is to do this kind of taking of a limited case. Limited case. Think about idealizing along some parameter, like how much friction there is. And it helps us to build some explanation of something. Like, you know, when you're an intro physics class, laws of motion often can be worked out this way. So these are models. These are not theories, right? There's no theory. I mean, maybe there's a theory of the friction with plane. I guess it's just basic laws of motion. But the model itself helps us to work out things. Thing is, that role in helping us 
us to work things out. It's not limited to these kind of idealized models. There's another familiar kind of model. We describe these as analogical models. Here's another one from Physics 1. Um, billiard ball model of gases. Gases are like <laughs> bunches of billiard balls bouncing around in a container. And of course, the state of the material has a lot to do with how much energy is in those billiard balls that are bouncing around. It plays a similar role in that when you turn to the thermodynamics section of Physics 1, you learn a lot about the basic laws of thermodynamics by thinking through these models. But it's important to note that this is not like these frictionless planes in that it's an idealization of something that's otherwise there. Gases are not made up of billiard balls. They're not made up of idealized billiard balls. They're not made up of anything like billiard. Well, actually, the like, I suppose, they are. Because there's, the picture is one of trying to analyze, analogize rigid bodies bouncing around to billiard balls. And so the, the analogical features here are very real. This is not an idealization of, of, a, of a limiting case. It's just an analogy which proves incredibly powerful for thinking about what gases are like. I hated the thermodynamics section of my physics class, so I'm going to move on from this one because I don't really know enough about it. But, oh, analogical models can get very big. Here's my one example that has anything to do with cognition. In the 1950s, a huge analogy emerged, which sort of marked what we sometimes call the cognitive revolution. It was the idea that the mind is like a computer. This is a really big picture analogical model, right? This is not as refined as billiard ball model of gases, but it nonetheless is a model that's incredibly influential. You know, it had a lot to do with the fall, the former fall of behaviorism. Behaviorism never quite dies, but the former fall of behaviorism had a lot to do with the emergence of this model. Um, so this was really active, and I suppose in certain ways still is. Kind of moved a little bit past it, so no, but rarely do people just sort of appeal to this all by itself. But in the sense of analogy, it's still very much there. But there are other kinds of models, so I'm going to start showing you some variety. Here's one from population biology. If you know your population biology, you'll find this very familiar. This is the predator prey model. It's really nice because you have a few distinct parameters you can set for a specific population. And then it tells you how the predator and prey sizes are oscillate. And there's no huge surprise here. If there's a lot of prey and more predators, but then you get too many predators and they kill off the prey, so they go down. And there's this distinctive out of phaseness here between the two curves, which these equations describe very well. But what's striking is this is a model. But it's not the same kind of thing as what we just looked at before. This is not an analogical model, nor is it an idealized sort of limiting case of something. Of course, it's a set of equations. But what's interesting about these models is that they have parameters that can be set and manipulated. So what do you do with these things? Well, of course, you capture observed phenomena. Um, but you also can look at how those parameters vary. And think, what would happen to the predator-prey cycle if I change the parameters? That's one of the things we can do with these models that you can't really do very well with an analogical model. Analogical models don't feed this kind of thinking about interventions very well. Yeah, I can't think how you'd intervene in the billiard ball model of gases. You could smash the billiard balls, but that really would kind of not help anything. And so models like that are ones that we're actually quite used to. Because you can set those up on a computer, you can run simulations with them, you can compare them to large data sets, you can think about what that tells you about setting your parameters. A lot of the things that people talk about when they talk about modeling these days are very much in that spirit of models with parameters that need to be set. So those are a few, I think, relatively familiar examples. But there's a lot more. And if you look in the space of things that go on in the sciences, the notion of model is quite large, and quite open-ended. So here's a model 
Um, that's kind of a pun, but it's actually not. Um, it's a model because it's a model in the sense of a little toy that you build, but it's actually not, because this is a scale model of an airplane. It's put in a wind tunnel, there are a whole bunch of sensors. Insofar as the scale model is accurate, you learn a lot about the behavior of that airplane by using that little toy. So it's not just a toy, it's a model. Not quite the same, it's not an, anal it's not an analogical model, not at all. Nor is it in any obvious way a limiting case, nor is it a set of equations. It's an accurate representation, we hope, of the plane that we can use to work with. And then we get the ones that really go a little crazy. This is a model. Um, if you work in the biomedical sciences, you'll know that this is a model. Um, it's a mouse. Mice are models. Why? Because they have some features that are not that different from humans, and some that aren't. Actually, it's more like this these days. This is a luciferase mouse, uh, genetically engineered, um, which can be a model of something. Actually, the engineering that goes into building these as models is extremely difficult. But what do you do? You want to study some aspect of the human body. You're not supposed to do horrible things to humans. You'd like to have some other organism that you're allowed to do kind of not nice things to. Um, that would appropriately reflect the features you want to study in the human body. So you build a model. You used to do it just by finding a model. That is, find an organism that seems to be close enough. Now we can actually build the models. That is, we can really produce organisms in some extended sense of where genetically engineered mice are. Or I guess they're organisms, I'm not sure they're anything else, but they're, they're rather unusual organisms. And we use them to produce fairly precise representations of various features of, say, humans or anything else that you might find appropriate. So they're models. So the variety of models is, to is huge, right? I mean, and it doesn't stop there. Practically anything in the right circumstances can be a model. When you think about mice, we're not going to stop with, I don't know what a limit is. A lot of the daily business of science is building models. Probably for many sorts of areas, that's the total daily business. OK, so let's go back to truth. Are models true? Yeah. I mean, in some cases, sure. I mean, if you set the right parameters, I'm pretty sure the Lotko-Vatera equations are extremely accurate. For all I know, they're absolutely true, though. That's always really risky. Ah, we got a head shake already. <laughs> okay, maybe not, but there's nothing impossible about that. But notice for some of these models, it's just a really odd question. I hand you a mouse and you say, is that true? No, I mean, maybe you could sort of elaborate a question that made sense there, but that doesn't seem like a natural question to ask. Um, yes, yeah, so actually this was what I was just saying, right? Maybe sometimes you can set parameters and you can get things that at least approximate truth. But the answer in many cases is very tricky. And so rather than truth, I think what we actually see is a kind of pattern of interaction between data and models, which is data responsive, accuracy inducing, but probably not well described in terms of truth and falsehood. So what do you do? You have phenomena. You can collect data about the phenomena. You have models. And we have lots of interactions between them. Oh, first point, which we kind of already touched on, because I'm running short of time, I'm going to do this relatively quickly. Sometimes models are just good for building theories, right? Analogical models are great for that. They're just helping theory construction. Um, what I want to focus on are these other cases where we're not just using analogical models to aid in theory construction. So one of the things that models can do is help you to refine your sources of data. So if you're working on something clinical, measurements you can gain from a patient are sometimes not all that accurate. Maybe you can get better measures off your mouse. Um, but the other thing is, once you have your mouse and you can start generating tons of data, you can start a rather complicated interaction. You 
can start tweaking your maps, particularly if you know how to engineer it, on the basis of the data you collect and see if you can get a better model. Then you generate more data and you start thinking about what that data tells you and maybe you go back and try to start tweaking your model again and you keep going and going and going. And I think in the end, we do get what's well described as an increasingly good accounts of the phenomenon. We learn a lot from this. Not always in the sense of fundamental physics, right? We don't always sort of get those straightforward analytic breakthroughs, but at least we learn a lot more about what's going on in the world. And so we hope that in a certain way this gets closer to truth, right? And so far as we think that we're understanding more, and our predictive powers are better, and our reliability is better, and all of those things are better. But I think the crucial thing is that we still don't really find the question of truth and falsehood to be very apt. Right? For these sorts of models, even though we think we get a better and better and better understanding, these are not the kinds of things that come out true simplicity. Um, same for confirmation. Right? Confirmation is actually in a rather awkward place for some models. Right? We don't confirm our model. We improve our model. Um, so confirmation doesn't go away. Occasionally we make claims that we'd like to confirm. The driving role of models is not things to be confirmed, just like it's not something to be true or false. It's something that we use to build. Oh, and so, yeah, mostly this is here to think about cute pictures of predators and prey. Uh, for some reason, predators are always really cute. Um, <laughs> not for the seal. Uh, so let's, because I'm running short of time, skip some of that. Let's see, where do we want to go for time purposes? Yeah. So how do we learn from a model? Just to jump ahead a little bit. Well, sometimes we learn just by refining our take on a large data set, generating a new data set. Sometimes we learn by trying to set some parameters. If you want to know about a particular population of bears and seals, you might learn a lot by taking your model trying to set some parameters, seeing if it describes the bears and seals as you see them, trying to set the parameters again, and eventually just setting the parameters can be a way to learn about the world. Um, with a mouse, right, we don't, setting parameters is not simple with a mouse. Right? You adjust the model. It's rather free, so we don't know exactly where to set. We don't have a structure that gives us clear parameters. We build a better model. We keep building and building and building. So back to this question of are they confirmed, um, and as I was saying a second ago, I think the answer is that this is a very odd question. Um, in some cases, if you're trying to set a parameter, you may get a fairly distinctive result about whether your parameter is close or not. But in many of these cases, we don't really expect them to. If you can get more data, if you can get a more refined picture, if you can build a better model, that's often as much as you want. Confirming your model, confirming your mouse. You can't really confirm a mouse. Now you might be able to confirm that a genetically engineered mouse maps onto a human re disease response in a very particular way. But that's not the same as confirming your model. That's verifying, in the sense of getting something that's evidence of truth, because these things weren't true or false. That's something that just helps you to know that your model is working well. It's reliable, it's valuable. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Right, so a little bit of wrap-up, which I think will put us, time's okay, right? Will put us at not too bad time. So if we ask the question, what are models? I really don't know how to answer this question. Because the space of things that we've already observed that count as models is huge, varied. We have idealized models, we have analogical models, we have sorts of equations with parameters that can be programmed and run simulations with. We have natural models, like mice. We have things that are not quite natural models, like knockout mice. Um, all of these are models, because all of these are useful for describing what's going on in the world around us, but it's very unclear, and not 100% clear to me by any means, whether there's absolutely one essential thing that makes them all models or not. So this is a very broad category. 
What about theories? Well, sometimes models are stepping stones to theories, analogical models or clear cases of that. Sometimes models are preliminaries to theories. You don't have a theory, but you've got a good model. In some of the most complicated cases, and I think, you know, um, life sciences are a good illustration of this, and actually lots of things that lots of people in this room work on are good illustrations of this, things are too complex to actually be a theory. Not that you wouldn't love it, but we don't have it. What we have is a model. And so sometimes these are replacements for theories. Things that work extremely well in the right cases, we can manipulate them, we can use them. Would it be nice to have a theory? Would it be nice to have an absolutely general set of equations that describe the phenomenon up to at least some boundary conditions? Yeah. Do we have it? Well, Newton's laws are, and I guess a little bit of relativity theory are some of the best cases I know, but in most cases, no, we don't. So a couple of quick morals. If anything, what I wanted to highlight today is that the various components of science, we think about models, data, theories, the relation between these is actually kind of complex and messy. Certainly, there's a sense in which we always want accuracy, we want more responsiveness to data, we want things to be better. But when it comes to these core notions like confirmation and truth, it's actually not so simple. Lots of models are not things that are straightforwardly confirmed. Lots of models are things that are not straightforwardly true. The nice thing about this is that question about approximate truth I talked about a few minutes ago. I think it, this is a good illustration of why we're cagey about the notion of approximate truth. In some cases, we can explain what it is to be approximately true, but your mouse is not approximately true any more than it's true. It's extremely useful, but it doesn't come true, it doesn't come almost true, it doesn't come kind of true, it comes useful. Um, so what happened to laws and explanations? Sometimes we have stepping stones to laws. Sometimes we have replacements for laws. If you don't have a law, sometimes you have a model, and what you can do is put something into your model and see what comes out. Are those as great the kind of predictive devices as laws were? No. The problem is we didn't have that many laws that were really those great predictive devices. The great predictive device was something that didn't quite turn out to be as great as it was supposed to be, and these are things that we actually have. You can drop something into your model, and out comes some predictions. So these are useful in real life. Laws are elusive. We'd love to have more. We're not sure if we have any. So quick wrap up. Things that I think most scientists know, but I think they're worth highlighting. It's more than data. It's much more than data. Um, we'd like to think about how predictions work explanations work, but we also want to think about where theories come from, how models function, and how they function in ways that are somewhat different from at least traditional views of theories. So we like to remind ourselves that it would be great if things turned out to be true, but in fact, we often have to work in a world where truth is not what we hit. Even confirmation is not always what we hit. We work fairly successfully anyway. Um, I suppose that's a slightly depressing note to end on, because this picture that science was just the search for truth was so nice and wonderful that it's not real. This, I think, is closer to what's real. So I'll wrap up with that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So we have some time for questions and comments. and. Thank you. Michael, I want to try and sneak in two questions, but feel free to ditch one. If you, um, so the first is, what's the role of mechanism in this account? And the, the second is, um, if I were to respond that, uh, that the relationship between like animal models and maybe the, the wind tunnel example and the collection that includes um, sets of equations, statistical models, 
um, and the like. But that, that's really just a matter of homonymy. There are two natural kinds there. And, but, but each of them is a perfectly good natural kind. Would that be an okay modification? Yeah, let me do the, let me do the second one and then the first one. Because the second one, I don't actually have any reason to say no. The only thought is just that there's a kind of methodological place where they play somewhat similar roles. That doesn't mean they aren't two natural kinds. Right? I mean, I can take one tool or another. I don't know exactly where my natural kind boundaries law lie, but yeah, I don't have any real objection to that. What's striking is that if I don't have a theory to hand, sometimes I'll go for like an animal model or a wind tunnel model. Sometimes, well, I guess if I want to think about a set of equations, I need at least something of a theory. But if I run a few simulations and extract some generalizations off my simulation, then I'm not so sure how big the difference is. So yeah, maybe what I'm coming to in answer to this is, yeah, if you really can have things like, I actually don't know how Locke and Volterra worked out their model, but if you could just have that insight, ah, here's the, here's the relationship, let's go test it, that does feel a lot more like theories. Um, in some of these other cases, it feels like something we do when we lack a theory, or at least... Now, back to the first question. One of the things that I find really striking about a lot of these domains is we're not great on mechanism. And it's frustrating. Um, one of the things about an animal model is that it often is really poor on mechanistic explanation. Sometimes it's because you can't figure it out. Sometimes it's just because it's not going to be there, right? Your model happened to overlap on just one little bit of phenomena, and the rest of the mechanism is missing. So I think one of the morals here is that, same as with truth and theory and generalization, right? Capturing mechanistic understanding of what's going on in some complex phenomenon is always one of the goals. But I think it's one that we just sometimes really do fundamentally live without. Um, we can make some progress without mechanism. That's, again, a little bit of a depressing note, because we'd love to have more. Great. So thanks for the really fun talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, when you were talking about analogical models with your example of gas molecules being likened to billiard balls, you know, it, it was occurring to me that, well, actually, billiard balls don't act like billiard balls yeah. either in this sense, right? Because they have English, you have topspin, you have undercutting, you have friction on the table. And so it got me thinking that somehow the existence of these two situations that can be described by the same general thermodynamic model lends credence to both of the situations, even though the, the laws don't really apply to gases that aren't ideal and it doesn't certainly apply to billiard balls. So is there something about scientists or people in general that like to think in terms of these models that apply to multiple different kinds of situations, even though it might not be perfectly apt in any of them? Yeah, uh, that's a, a great question, which I really don't know the answer to, but here I just simply want to channel my colleague, Dedra Gentner, who I think would have an answer to this. And given that there are lots of people interested in cognition in the room, the feature you described is one that certainly is a feature of a lot of analogical reasoning. Even in the base domain, we project features off it. Um, and, you know, I suppose if we try and do little, not exactly experiments, but play around with the billiard balls on the table, we're sort of good at ignoring the fact that the spin does seem to affect things. When we think about building the analogy, we project features off one domain and then try to project them into another domain. And that does seem, at least Dedra tells me, and I believe everything Dedra says, uh, uh, <laughs> I believe many things Dedra says, um, that we're pretty good at this. And so it does seem like a pretty likely conjecture that one of the things that drives our ability to do this kind of exploration, and I take it that there's no evidence that other creatures do it quite our way. I don't know, I mean, anybody know enough about great apes to know if they do proto-theory forming? But nonetheless, it seems like one of the things that we are driven by when we do this, and it's striking that it's in theory development, 
is this ability to reason pretty complicated, in pretty complicated analogical ways. So I don't know the facts here, but it seems like a really nice conjecture that this would be really important. Is there any other questions and comments? Well, if there are no questions, no comments, then let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> and we have a 10 minutes break without coffee, but just, uh, just a non-existing coffee, but um, just a break. <laughs>